I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to view our DVD video set up here. We um, present in a live format and we're taping this to give you the opportunity to get the same amount of information in your own personal setting. The nurses as a group at the clinic got together and noticed that in one part of the clinic there was a certain approach to blood pressure and cholesterol, the other parts had different approaches and we wanted to standardize everything. We've been doing this class for about six months now. Feedback from everyone has gotten us to the level that we're at now. So we think it's pretty good because most folks think it's not too boring, it's not too long. Of course, you have the luxury to fast forward. And that it kind of gives them the information that they need. Please understand that there are additional courses available for nutrition, for the behavioral modification, stress management. You'll have follow-up with your nurses in eight to 12 weeks and you can always contact your providers. This is not a one-stop shop. So we'll hit it. We're talking this morning or this afternoon or this evening, wherever you're at, about the clinical component for this disease process. And we're concerned with why the medical folks get upset if your blood pressure is up or if you have high fats or high lipids in your blood. What is the big deal? Hopefully, at the end of this class, you'll appreciate a few of the reasons. You'll know why we care. You'll know what your normals are and what your goals will be. And know what you can do to kind of make a difference in your lifestyle. Again, this is one of our class comments about being motivated to be healthy. It all comes back to Leon from the plumbing department. I went and talked to Leon at the Bellevue department and he was looking at me kind of crazy because I was sort of looking goofy and not panicked. Because it seems that when people go to the plumbing department, they are really upset and really nervous because their plumbing is backed up. The whole system is the same for what we're going to talk about today because our body is full of pipes. Pipes are plumbing. So if you're worried about your plumbing and your health being upset, we hope by the end of this you'll, you'll be concerned that your plumbing in your body is upset. So Leon says, take it seriously. Now, of course in our body, the blood carries our nutrients, our oxygen, all of the components for life. The heart is our pump that gets all that stuff going around through our pipes. And if something happens to our pump, it messes up our pipes. If something happens to our pipe, it messes up our pumps. On our slide, you'll see that it kind of goes around in blue and red, and it's one connection. It all goes around in a circle, as does our body. It all is joined together. So the parts of our body are affected in different ways. We have our our plumbing and if you notice it gets bigger and as it goes out it gets smaller well it will be even smaller as we'll see in a minute we're also connected with elasticity in our whole component because blood pressure is connected to the pressure if you're green it's very flexible and easy and that's what young kids are usually like folks who are hitting 30 or 40 it's a little bit stiffer a little bit different a little bit more of an issue folks that have cholesterol or blood pressure issues tend to have more problems with that and you can't pull it on your DVD there, but it really makes a huge difference. Then when you put some fat components in with your stretchy issues, it's a bad thing. So basically what we're talking about here is if we've got those pressure stretchy issues, and if we've got our fat circumference issues, each one of those is bad, but when we put them together, it's really a double whammy. Just a minute to talk about what we're talking about for the cholesterol part. So it would probably be a representative of a normal person, maybe in their 30s or so. The green would be when you're a baby and life is pristine and golden. We're starting to get layers of plaque just through aging and by having high cholesterol. As we add more component problems, this gets thicker. I don't know if you can really see it on my little test tubes here, but we've kind of got a little bit of red and some murky white stuff in here. A little bit clumpy and kind of not really clear and perfect. Well, that's probably someone in their 20s. When you get 30s or 40s or you start having cholesterol problems, it gets, doesn't look so bad if you turn it that way, but when we get it on the side, wow. And that's the problem is this stuff starts clumping in irregular ways and irregular places. And it can get so that it's almost all clumpy stuff and not much blood going through. So that's very problematic. And we'll talk now about what can happen to these things. So, if our pump has problems, the physical walls are all made out of this elastic. So if the elastic isn't working well and it has to work harder to get the blood to itself, you're going to have problems. That wall will get sick and you'll have heart enlargement and all kinds of other issues. You can have other problems with your vessels where you've kind of got a bleb, like a tire bleb in there. These babies can burst. John Ritter died of that aneurysm, and those are considered medical emergencies. If you've got that in your history, you need to make sure your doctor knows about it. The other concern is 
the coronary vessels, the heart vessels themselves, the heart as it pumps actually supplies the blood supply to itself. Well, those vessels are actually a little bit smaller than this would be, some of them, even more fine. Well, as you can see here, that is not a very big tube. And if you start getting coatings of bad stuff on that, there's not much, much room to expand there. So when these guys get kinked off, you end up with heart attacks. I've actually been in open heart situations where the doctors there, Kathleen, how about taking a feel on this and you kind of put it between your fingers and it sort of feels like you're crunching stuff. It's the plaque that's built up in here. So it's very serious. And again, as it can't supply blood to itself, it has more and more problems, it fails, and it can eventually lead to heart failure and death. So your heart can go kaboom, your kidneys can go kaboom. You can see it on your little slide there. This kind of looks like something, a stick with all kinds of fur on it. Well, the fur on the edges are actually little pieces of your blood vessels. And as you see, it's even more fine or finer than this thing here. It's almost like hair. And so if you start layering up, coating that with cholesterol problems, that's gonna start having problems soon. So you're very likely in this whole workup from your medical side to have a, a urinary analysis, check your urine to see what's going on with that. Because if the kidney starts having problems, it will show up in the urine, and if that kidney has problems, it will also release other hormones and things that can create even more problems for yourself. So again, another double whammy issue. We have a comment here about Ask GIF. I don't know if you folks watch The Office, but that tall seven foot guy GIF, he has been uh, ignoring his blood pressure for 10 years, and he's now on the kidney transplant list, and he's on dialysis three times a week, so it happens everywhere. The next slide, I don't know if anybody's been watching that Discovery Channel with that big tough Captain Phil. Well, Captain Phil is dead. He ended up having a stroke because he's a smoker and all kinds of problems with his plumbing. So again, that brain is very much at risk with this disease process. It can be from a little bit of kind of mildness. You might think, oh, I'm getting to be 40, that's why I'm forgetting. Or it could be something going on in your brain. The dementia area, as it worsens, you can have the mini strokes, or you can have the real stroke, which is a real bad thing. Anything with your heart, anything with your brain, get to the emergency room, please. We've got a slide there, and if you talk to your healthcare providers, you can actually get a little magnet to stick on your refrigerator, or if you need one for grandma, whatever. Just a reminder about what you're looking at if there's a concern for stroke. If you ask people to smile, one side's kind of maybe a little droopy or a little bit off. If you ask them to close their eyes, put their hands out, one of their arms will drift and they don't even realize it. And then if their speech is kind of slurred without a known reason, that could very much be a symptom of something going on in their brain. You want to hit the emergency room as soon as possible, call 911 because time is brain. So moving on from our brain to our eyes. Now on this slide as it comes up and down, it's really showing almost like chicken skin how fine those little veins are. Again, going back to our concept here, we've got this size maybe for our heart, this size maybe for our kidney. The eyes, it's even smaller vessels. So again, you'll start having problems sooner. And the concern with the, the vision is if you lose it, a lot of times you can't get your vision back. Reminder, smokers, you're four times more likely to have blindness related to some of these cardiovascular diseases if you've got that smoking Problem. So if you can stop that, that would be good. Moving on to the rest of our body, and we call that peripheral artery disease, which means anything not in our core is in our periphery. So basically, anything else that's not talked about so far can also be affected. We can have pain, we can have swelling, we can have ulcers, we can have nail issues, hair issues. Basically, if your body's out of balance, it's going to let you know, and you'll have problems. So talk to your docs. Other issues we haven't talked about now are sexual dysfunction. In the military, we monitor people pretty closely, but on the outside community, a lot of the guys don't present until they're maybe 25, 35, 45, somewhere in that range, and they're having problems with their performance, their sexual performance. The first thing we do is check their blood pressure, and quite frequently, we find that there's a connection between that blood pressure and the performance issue. Getting things under control can make a huge difference. You'll be hearing a lot about bone loss and vitamin D and making connections with that. They're doing more and more research into that, and so we're looking at that closely. So if your doctor's checking for vitamin D and you're thinking, huh, it's connected to that calcium and how it works with your blood pressure. Trouble sleeping. 
my colleagues told me that half the folks they work with for CPAP actually are not fat, which was my understanding that only fat folks had breathing, sleeping problems when they're breathing, sleeping and obstructing, but that's not true. We do have the ability that you can get a finger probe on and wear a belt and actually sleep at home and not have to go to the sleep lab and that's kind of a screening tool and that can be quite accurate except for folks that are mouth breathers. So you can do that and it's actually free of charge to TRICARE so it's something you could talk to your provider about. But again, if you have trouble sleeping, you need that CPAP. Research right now isn't sure if it's the blood pressure that's causing the breathing problems or the breathing with the blood pressure, but it makes everything up. So it's a big concern. So some things about actually measuring our blood pressure, we want to do at the same time, the same place, the same position, the same cuff. Your doctor's not really looking at a one-off, ooh, my blood pressure is 156 over 100 today. He's looking at the trend, or she, and they want to know what's going on. So you need to kind of look at that pattern and record your results. We don't want you rushing around and all excited. This probably wouldn't be a good time to check my blood pressure. But we want you kind of sitting down and a manual cuff pressure is the one that really makes a difference for that. Heart level and everything like that. And again, write those numbers down. Older folks, they call it technically you're old when you're 80 now, yay. However, if you're frail or you know someone that's frail, just small, younger, you know, just not very strong. Those folks tend to have problems with pressures when they move or change positions. So it might be okay if they're sitting down and everything's good, but if grandma stands up and all of a sudden her blood pressure goes through the roof, she'll be falling and breaking her hip and having all kinds of issues. So that's why we want to kind of check uh, sitting and standing pressure if anyone complains about dizziness. The cuff size, you want to make it the right size. If you're a person that's a little bit fatter, they've got longer cuffs now. So we want it to be accurate. And again, we're looking for the trends. Reminder on your slide, if your blood pressure is coming up 180 over 110, that's considered a medical emergency and you need to hit the emergency room and not mess around. We have had, had, we have had people in their early 20s, 24 year old, presenting with 170 over 100 and vision changes. And they had blood pressure issues and needed to be seen and were put on medicines and it's serious. So, don't poo-poo any of these symptoms. You need to know your numbers. You need to know what we're looking for and where you're at. So hopefully either before you view the video or after you view the video, you get your numbers with your healthcare providers. If you're normal, it's below with the top number systolic, the diastolic's the bottom number, but you want your top number below 120 and your bottom number below 80. Now, when we're talking about the rest of these numbers, if the top number is out of whack or the bottom number is out of whack, you qualify in that category. So it's not both numbers, it's either side can get you a ding. Prehypertension, if your top is anywhere from 120 to 139 or your bottom number is anywhere from 80 to 89. Many, 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 many people, healthcare providers are now treating prehypertension because they don't want all this damage that we've talked about now. Now if that top number is 140 to 159 or the bottom number is 90 to 99, you've got hypertension confirmed and it's stage one and then the higher those numbers are, the, the more concerning in the higher stage of blood pressure that you have. So our goal is 120 over 80 or below. If you have that diabetic card, under no circumstance do you ever want your pressure above 130 over 80. Sometimes doctors will let some other people go into 140 over 90. That typically is folks that they may have tried a blood pressure med on or something that they had a weird side effect or, you know, but that's that very gray area and you want to really, really be careful with your numbers. So now we'll look at some other risk factors that can affect you, your age. As we get older, that increases our risk factor. The guys have a higher chance than the, the women and they start having problems sooner than women do. We'll be looking in a minute at total and HDL, the different types of cholesterol. Again, that's tobacco use, your blood pressure readings, and if you've been treated for hypertension. The African American folks just genetically have a higher card uh, problem with that, as do American Indians and some of the other ethnic groups. So you need to look at your family history closely too. Stress can impact everyone as it does. There's a little component at the end of our course which will help address that. Genetics, there's not much we can do about the hands that we're dealt. We are what we are, but we can do these other things to try and make that effect as small as we possibly can. 
Then we're looking at knowing our numbers. And again, hopefully you'll have the numbers before you look at this. If not, get the numbers and, and look at this seriously. Our cholesterol, we want to keep below 200. That's our total cholesterol number. I try and remember that 200 on my cholesterol and 200 on your food label there. H, we've got up here on our screen, the HDL cholesterol in green. That's because it's healthy, happy, helper. Those are the ones that will actually take those bad fat molecules, connect to it, and take it to the liver and remove it from your body. So those healthy guys bring it out and that's good. This is probably the only time that you want to have a high number and you want to be over 40. Normally we all want to go back to our youth, but this is a 40 that's a good thing. Women, they even like to have it higher in 50. So remember those H, healthy, happy, helper ones we want high. The other one we have here is in red. That's the LDL, the lethal, lousy, bad cholesterol. So if you look at your number and your LDL is high, that's a bad thing. We want those LDL numbers low. Really, they, they say 130 on our slides, but they even want it below 100. So the LDL needs to be low. The problem with that is these LDL guys are the ones that take those molecules and they stick stick it on the sides of our arteries. So those are the ones that are going to increase our chances of heart attack and stroke. So we want those low. Triglycerides, we want below 150. That's just a different kind of fat in our blood cell. Some people genetically have more problems with triglycerides. Other folks have cholesterol. Some folks, unfortunately, have problems with both. So those are our numbers and you need to know where you're at and where you want to go. We will recheck these. Your nurses can work with you and recheck your labs in 12 weeks. We want to see what you're doing once you've tried to change your behavior patterns. I have a picture up here of this guy with this really big belly, which we have one person in our class say, oh, well, he's not really fat because it's under here that you're going to measure. When we're talking about body fat increases, we actually want to lean over and measure where the cross or the bend is in our waist across our belly button. And that's when we're measuring, and this actually goes around me, yippee. Women, we want to have a waist measurement of no more than 35 inches. Men get 40 inches. If it's over that, you're going to get a tick for a problem here. We're looking at high blood, blood pressure, triglycerides, if you've ever had a high blood sugar. And again, if those healthy guys are low, it's a problem. We'll have a checklist on our next slide. We're talking a little bit here about BMI. If you don't know your BMI, you need to work on that with your healthcare provider. If your BMI is below 25, you're good and healthy. 25 to 30, you're in that obese fat range. And, uh, sorry, overweight. Over 30, you're obese. And if you're over 35, it's morbidly obese. Morbidly or morbidity means death. It means that your chances of dying related to your fat issue is significant. So you need to keep that BMI under 35 in all circumstances. The lower the better, but again, you don't want to get it too low. So all of these issues that you see on your slide, your waist, your triglyceride, ATL, BP, blood pressure, each one of those gives you a little tick on your graph there. If you have three ticks, that means you've got a significant chance of developing diabetes, and that's what this is all about. Metabolic syndrome, syndrome X, is an early or a pre-warning of the possibility of diabetes. If you have three of these factors, if you don't work on it, you're almost certain to get diabetes. Why do we care about diabetes? Is all of the things that we've talked about during this presentation are magnified and worsened. Diabetes doesn't go away, and it makes a real impact on your life and the length of your life. So if we can avoid it, which a lot of people can, if you know, it's really worth the effort. This slide, we're addressing some of the things that we can do, mo our lifestyle modifications. We can lose weight. We can exercise, we can lower our salt at our meals. All of these combined will lower our blood pressure. Oh shucks, I've got a bad thing here on my slide. We'll cut that out for you. <laughs> All of these things combined can lower your blood pressure and your cholesterol issues. The concern is, is that they don't work quickly. They can take anywhere from three to 12 months before you'll see the effect. A lot of folks don't have that much time, especially our flyers who really have a short window of opportunity to get their numbers under control or it affects their job. So we look at some other things after our lifestyle modification. Anytime you improve your fat and cholesterol control in your blood system, you are helping your blood vessels any way you shake it because you won't get the blood cells stuck in here and it will help everything. 
So if we can't do our lifestyle modifications or we don't have time or our numbers are so high and concerning, we then usually get started on medications. We talk a little bit about medicines because a lot of people come in with a baggie full of the, they go to the diet things and they've got two inch pills and a bag full of it and they'll just take that but they don't want to take a water pill to help their blood pressure. We don't quite get that because we are helping your body for these reasons. Anyway, those are the pros for us. The cons, occasionally you will have a side effect, but it will help you in a quick way, and that's the concern. So that's our presentation, basically. We hope at this point that you understand why the medical folks are concerned about your blood pressure and your fats, because it can affect and will affect your heart, your brain, your kidneys, your eyes, your sexual function, and all your body parts. The normals that we want you to know, 200 for your total cholesterol. We want that healthy, happy, helper person to be high and above 40. The lethal, deadly, lousy folks to be lower, 130 on our labs, even lower if possible at 100. And the triglycerides below 150. What things can we change to make our life better? Diet, exercise, medications, stopping smoking, all of our healthy ha habits, but the part that we really think you've done by viewing this video is you have now empowered yourself with knowledge, and that's what it's all about. You can't fix what you don't know is broken. Hopefully at this point you'll appreciate that you do have something that is broken and needs your support and help to fix. Thanks so much. Our numbers are in the guides. If you need us, please give us a call. Well, good morning. My name is Maynard Rosenberg and I'm one of the pharmacists uh, here at the 55th Medical Group. Uh, today we're going to talk about hypertension and lipids uh, from the pharmacy perspective. These are our objectives. We want to recognize the medications that are available to treat high blood pressure and high blood cholesterol. We want to know what side effects may occur with these medications and most important that we understand our own medications. Okay, so first of all, what are the symptoms of high blood pressure? Well, unfortunately there usually are no symptoms and generally we don't know whether or not we have high blood pressure until it is picked up on some other kind of screening. One third of those who have high blood pressure are totally unaware. Uh, symptoms that can occur with high blood pressure in extreme circumstances can uh, be severe headache, fatigue or confusion, vision problems, chest pain, difficulty breathing, and uh, the feeling that you're skipping a heartbeat. So what are the, some of the remedies that we can, uh, we can use to alleviate this problem? Well, our blood pressure medication options. Now, there are six different types or classes of medication uh, that we use to treat blood pressure. And, uh, and most providers will start with a water pill, which is kind of the entry level to, uh, to these things. The decision on what, uh, what we use to treat blood pressure is really up to the doctor, and uh, he'll make that decision based on what is right for you. So, first of all, uh, we generally start with diuretics. Uh, the examples that we'll be giving here are, uh, are there are many drugs in, the, in these, each of these classes, but we're going to focus on the ones that are most commonly prescribed and are available uh, from the pharmacy in the med group. So typically we would start with hydrochlorothiazide uh, or furosemide, which is uh, commonly referred to as Lasix. Uh, these diuretics remove extra water. Uh, they uh, can help swelling in the legs can be taken with or without food, but are best taken in the morning. Generally are taken once a day. Why do we take them in the morning? Well, they cause you to excrete uh, water and, uh, and naturally, you know, if you take them at bedtime, you're going to be waking up in the middle of the night and having to go to the bathroom. So uh, it's a good idea to take them in the morning. Uh, sodium intake, salt, can affect water weight gain, as we all know. So if we limit the amount of salt in our diet, you know, as much as we can or control the amount of salt, we can limit the amount uh, of diuretics that we need. Side effects uh, that can be caused by diuretics are cramps or muscle weakness. 
Next class up would be the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin re uh, receptor blockers, the ARBs. Uh, examples of these are uh, lisinopril, fosinopril, losartan, and telmisartan. Uh, these, uh, these meds actually open and expand blood vessels. This would be the medication that a diabetic would generally be started on and is kind of the next step up from the di uh, diuretics. Side effects that are most common, uh, they can sometimes cause some angioedema. This is, uh, this is a very serious condition. It's a swelling of the lip, face, or tongue. And, uh, and if this happens to you, uh, you should go directly to the emergency room. Don't, don't stop and call your doctor or ask if, if this is usual or anything else, because if this interferes with breathing, you know, then, uh, then you could die. So, so if this were to occur, you would go immediately, immediately to the emergency room. Now, let me say a word about side effects. Uh, we're going to be talking about side effects, and many of these side effects are shared among the classes of medication. Uh, side effects are unex untoward uh, effects and effects that, uh, that all medications have but uh, are not necessarily the effect that we're trying, uh, trying to get from the medication. But side effects generally occur uh, within the first couple of doses of taking the medication. So if something unusual happens when you start the medication, something unexpected, something that you're not wanting to happen, this is the time to talk to the doctor. Uh, and they will occur right at the, at the very start. Now, if you don't experience side effects within the first couple of doses of taking a new medication, then you're not going to have side effects from that medication. So, uh, so anything that happens after that is generally not related to your new medication. Okay, going on to the beta blockers, atenolol and metoprolol. Uh, most commonly prescribed is Toprol XL. The reason for that is it can be given once a day and, uh, and lowers blood pressure. It also decreases your heart rate. One of the side effects is that it can slow the heart rate when exercising, can cause some dizziness when standing, or uh, fatigue or a headache. Uh, those of you who uh, are, are still in the military uh, or who exercise on a regular basis, uh, sometimes this will uh, lower your heart rate so much that uh, your muscles actually don't get enough blood and you can experience uh, unusual fatigue. Uh, talk to your doctor about this. It's possible that if that occurs, as it did in my case, that uh, your dose of medication can be lowered you know, so that you get an adequate amount. We never want to give more medication than we have to. Calcium channel blockers, Norvasc, uh, uh, Nifedipine, Diltiazem, and Verapamil. Next class of, uh, of uh, medication. Side effects can be swelling of the legs, sometimes headache, again, slow heart rate, or dizziness when standing. The peripheral alpha blockers, Minipress, Hytrin, and Cardura. These are some of the oldest of uh, the blood pressure medications that we use. Not as commonly prescribed anymore, but uh, still some doctors like to use them. They do have the added benefit of increasing HDL, which is the good cholesterol, and lowering LDL, the bad cholesterol. Side effects can be muscle weakness, dizziness when standing, headache or uh, fainting after the first dose. Uh, these side effects can be decreased by taking these medications at bedtime. And last, the newest class of medications that we have are the renin inhibitors. Only uh, the only one that we have uh, currently is Tecturna. It expands the blood vessels, can be taken with it with or without food and has the unfortunate side effect of occasionally causing diarrhea. It, this can also cause some angioedema, which, uh, as we noted earlier, swelling of the face, tongue, or lips. Once again, 
Most medication startup side effects will only last for the first three to five days. They generally occur within the first couple of doses and disappear uh, after you've been taking it for a little bit. Do not abruptly stop taking your blood pressure medication. That can cause uh, a rebound of, uh, of high blood pressure and uh, other side effects. So if you're considering uh, discontinuing a, a blood pressure medication, talk to your provider. Check your blood pressure at home or at a local pharmacy with a, an upper arm cop, cuff and keep track of your readings. I myself keep a little diary of my, uh, my blood pressure. When I go in and have my prescriptions refilled at, uh, at my pharmacy, I check, you know, go in, uh, sit in a little booth, check my blood pressure, and write it down. So that way you know whether you're trending up or trending down. All right, on to cholesterol medication. We've already talked this morning about the different types of cholesterol, LDL, the, the lousy uh, low-density lipoproteins. Ideally, we want to keep our LDL under 100, under 70 if we're diabetic. HDL, which is the healthy cholesterol, we would like to increase to uh, above 40 per, uh, milligrams per deciliter for men, above 50 for women. Now. Uh, HDL can only be increased by exercise, but there are some drugs that uh, will slightly raise your HDL. So that's kind of uh, not considered their primary purpose, but it is a uh, uh, side effect. Triglycerides, why, ideally we want to keep them under 150, and our total cholesterol, which the com is the combination of all these, plus the very low density lipoproteins, we want to keep under 200. The higher the LDL, the higher the risk of heart attack and stroke. LDL carries cholesterol into your artery walls. Okay, now if this is a representation of the artery, LDL actually paints the inside of your vessels. And it adds layer upon layer upon layer until this can become completely occluded. It can, be, uh, it can be blocked entirely. This is what happened in my case. My coronary arteries uh, uh, filled up with LDL, low density lipoproteins, and completely blocked two and won 95 percent and the result of that was a heart attack. HDL the healthy cholesterol actually removes cholesterol from blood vessels. It can be increased with uh, exercise, and there is one medication, niacin, which can increase uh, HDL very slightly, and this is considered a side effect. Yes, sir? I just have a quick question. Sure. Uh, my HDL is good, my LDL. Uh -huh. Looks like I'm good there, but my overall cholesterol is 259. Mm -hmm. Okay, the question is, you know, if, uh, if you're within normal range on each of, your, uh, uh, each of your individual components, how can you be over, you know, what you need to be? And uh, I guess the answer is that when you add all of them together, once your risk factor is elevated in each, then all that can combine to an unhealthy, uh, an unhealthy level, a total level. So what we want to do is reduce each of the bad components, the uh, LDL cholesterol, as much as we possibly can, you know, by, uh, by proper diet, exercise, and if necessary, medication. And, uh, and eventually that number will come down. That's so, probably re related to your diet, too. Mm -hmm. um, And we'll be talking about diet later in the program, but thank you for your question. 
Okay, triglycerides, a fancy name for fat in your blood. High levels can cause pancreatitis and inflammation of the pancreas. Uh, they can be uh, decreased by decreasing alcohol and by decreasing uh, high fat foods. Okay, so treatment options. Well, the first and most important and the best way to go is lifestyle modifications. If we want to eat, we want to try to eat a healthy diet, exercise, manage our weight, stop smoking if, uh, if we're still smoking, and if all of that together is not sufficient, then we go to medication. The American Heart Association says that medication can be considered for patients who, in spite of adequate dietary therapy, regular physical activity, and weight loss, need further treatment for elevated blood cholesterol levels. Cholesterol uh, treatment generally starts uh, with statins, and all these drugs end with statin. Zocor, Simvastatin, Atorvastatin, which is Lipitor, and Crestor. And I can see that uh, some of you are on these meds. These meds uh, actually block cholesterol uh, that's made in the liver. They're used to treat uh, total high and LDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, and low HDL. They can be taken with or without food and are generally taken once a day. They should be taken at bedtime. The reason is that in addition to the dietary cholesterol that we get, we are manufacturers of cholesterol. So uh, the liver manufactures cholesterol and that manufacturer is, a, is at its peak when we are in REM sleep a couple of hours after we've gone to sleep at night. So. If we take our statin at bedtime, it reaches its peak blood level at about the same time that the liver is producing the most cholesterol. And that is when it is most effective. So if you're taking a statin once a day, take it at bedtime. We'll talk a little bit about side effects. These side effects, uh, I'm going to list them for each of the classes of drugs, but are pretty common to all the classes of drugs that, that we're going to discuss. Uh, statins can sometimes cause some abdominal pain, some gas, constipation, or headache. Uh, usually, as I've said about side effects, these are transient and uh, will occur wh when you're first starting a medication, but generally will not last. The side effect that is most important is muscle pain, tenderness, or weakness. If that occurs, that's something to talk about with your physician or prescriber immediately because that's an untoward side effect and uh, would be a reason to discontinue this medication. It's a good idea to get a liver function test uh, immediately uh, at the time you start taking uh, statin and then uh, a month or two afterwards till we make sure that, uh, that the drug is not harming your liver. Uh, drug interactions, it, uh, they do interact with gemfibrozil and niacin, but uh, that your doctor will make a determination and uh, sometimes these things will be prescribed together. I personally take uh, niacin and the statin at the same time. That's what my doctor has uh, decided is best for me. Uh, grapefruit juice. We are uh, often told to avoid grapefruit juice when we're taking a statin because of uh, an enzyme called papain that is, is found in grapefruit juice. But uh, the amount of uh, papain that you're going to get from uh, a reasonable quantity of uh, grapefruit juice will not affect your statin. You don't need to discontinue the uh, drinking grapefruit juice if you like it. Generally, people who drink it, drink it in the morning with breakfast and uh, take their statin at night and there's no problem with this at all. If you're on the grapefruit diet and only eating grapefruit, that might be a reason uh, uh, not, to, uh, not to be on this diet while taking a statin. Bile and acid binding resins. Cholestid and Questrol, these are some of the oldest cholesterol medications. Uh, not as commonly used anymore. They're gritty. They have to be mixed uh, with uh, water or fruit juice. Uh, not very pleasant to take. They allow us to, uh, to excrete the fat out of our system, 
but they're not very commonly prescribed anymore. They are used in the treatment of uh, high LDL and can be co combined uh, with other cholesterol medications if it's necessary to take it. If you do take a bile acid binding resin, they should be taken, uh, best taken in the morning, should be taken with plenty of water or liquid. Uh, if you're taking the tablets rather than the powder, swallow the tablets whole and do not crush or chew them. They can cause some constipation or gas and some nausea or heartburn. Uh, because of the nature uh, uh, of their properties, they can interfere with the absorption of other drugs. So if you're taking this med, take it one hour before or four to six hours after taking your other medications. Niacin, vitamin B3, the only, uh, the only uh, product on the market for, uh, for cholesterol is niacin. This is a, a niacin that can only be prescribed by your doctor. It's a, a once a day long acting niacin. It is not the same as the niacin that you would find in the grocery or, or, uh, or the pharmacy over the counter drug aisle. So that is rapidly uh, acting niacin and, uh, and does not work in the same way as this long acting niacin. So don't buy niacin over the counter. Uh, only take niacin as prescribed by your physician. It's used in the treatment of uh, LDL high triglycerides and, uh, and it does have some effect uh, in elevating low HDL. Niacin is best taken with meals. Can cause some flushing, although the long acting form generally doesn't. Uh, flushing can be avoided by taking a baby aspirin about 30 minutes before taking the niacin dose, dose and avoiding hot liquids immediately after taking it. It should not be taken by patients who have ulcers and uh, for those who have gout, it can precipitate an attack of gout. Diabetics should avoid niacin because it can increase their blood sugars. And although it's said that it interacts with statins, as I've said, they're commonly prescribed together. Fibrates, gemfibrozil and phenylfibrate, uh, one of the other classes of drugs, also used to treat high triglycerides, are generally taken uh, 30 minutes before a meal. And the side effect profile is very much the same as, uh, as the other cholesterol medications. Uh, fibrates can cause some gallstones and that's something to be, uh, to be considered if you are prone to, uh, to gallstones. Drug interactions, uh, if, uh, if they do cause some muscle pain, then uh, interaction with statins can, uh, can worsen that. If uh, you are on, uh, on Coumadin, they can increase your, uh, your uh, Coumadin levels. However, Coumadin and fibrates can safely be given together. It's just that the dose of the Coumadin would need to be adjusted. And since patients on Coumadin uh, frequently have their blood levels checked, you know, this is an easy thing to, uh, to correct. Cholesterol absorption inhibitors. Zetia is uh, the one we see prescribed on television, or, or uh, not prescribed, but uh, advertised on television all the time. Uh, they say that it uh, works in a different ma manner than our other cholesterol medications. That is, it inhibits the absorption of cholesterol in the small intestine. It used to, uh, used to treat uh, high LDL and is often taken with a statin. Vitorin is an example of a medication that is a combination of a statin, simvastatin, and, uh, and Zetia. The only advantage to uh, taking Vitorin is that you take one tablet rather than two, and uh, if you're out on the economy and getting your medication at a retail pharmacy, then uh, uh, you would have one copay rather than two copays. Uh, Vitorin, or I, I should say Zetia, can be taken with or without food. And as you see, it can also cause some nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Although it's said that it, uh, it interacts with fibrates, they are also frequently prescribed together. Now a word about supplements. Supplements are over-the-counter products which are not as closely regulated by the FDA as drug products. Uh, 
There are many people that uh, take and recommend supplements. Many of our friends will say, oh, I, I, uh, I take fish oil capsules and, uh, and they're great. You know, my cholesterol has gone down and uh, I've really been impressed, uh, impressed by this. Uh, I recommend against taking supplements. Supplements are not as, as well regulated as medications, first of all, and, uh, and they can interfere, actually interfere with the action of, uh, of your prescription medications. Fish oil capsules, for example, can cause your other medications, if taken at the same time, to be not as well absorbed. So don't take supplements in, unless your doctor says, uh, says to take them. And always, you know, whenever uh, you're in the, in the uh, provider's office, be sure and let them know if you're taking supplements, you know, what you're taking, uh, vitamins, supplements, anything else in addition to your medications. When you're asked to give a list of your medications, be sure and include these things because these can actually interfere with, uh, with the absorption and, in, and action of your medi prescription medications. American Heart Association recommends getting, uh, getting these uh, products through food sources. Now, how can you tell if something is a supplement? Well, if you turn it over on the back and it says one serving is a teaspoonful or two capsules or a wafer or whatever, that's a supplement, okay? These are examples of supplements over-the-counter niacin, as we've talked about before, omega-3 fatty acids, which can be in uh, fish oil or flax seed. And as we said, supplements are measured in servings. Okay, so how do we, what do we want to know about our medications? We want to know the names of our medications, both the brand name, Zocor, and the generic name for that medication, Simvastatin. And most, both of those will generally be on your prescription label. Now, why you're taking your medication, whether you're taking it for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or whatever. And know when you're taking your medication, when the best time of the day to take your meds are. We can maximize our health care by knowing our goals, keeping track of our numbers, and being our own advocates. Remember, you're only going to see your provider once or uh, twice a year but you are the one who is going to manage your health care. So if you have any questions, you can call a pharmacist anytime at the clinic pharmacy, 294-7358, or at the satellite pharmacy, 294-3229. I split my time about equally between the two pharmacies, but if you call anytime during business hours and ask for a pharmacist, Anyone will be happy to help you. You know, just uh, you know, gather your questions about your medication anytime you start anything new, or you feel like you're having a side effect, or or you have any reason to be concerned about your med. You know, be sure and give us a call. We'll be happy to help you anytime, and that goes for medication that you get at outside pharmacies as well. You know, it doesn't have to be something that comes from our clinic pharmacy. I had a yes. Ally that blocks the fat absorption and stuff. Um, one of my patients was asking me if it affected the cholesterol triglyceride, and I didn't know. I just wondered if you knew anything about that ally thing. Ally, uh, it ally blocks the absorption of fat, and that will uh, will help your cholesterol. Uh, but uh, remember that uh, at the same time that is going to affect the absorption of your prescription medications. You know, you have to be very careful about taking these types of products because uh, you're going to be uh, affecting the action and, uh, and the absorption of other things that you're taking at the same time. So it's not a good idea to start on these things without at least letting your doctor know and, uh, and getting his input, you know, or your provider, you know, nurse practitioner, whatever. Make sure that you get their input anytime you're changing your regimen.